Dr. Heiser, in your book, you argue that this Deuteronomy 32 worldview throws light on this famous text from the very first chapter of the Bible. Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. Many ancient Catholic readers have thought that here in Genesis 1, God, that is the Father, must have been talking to the Logos, to the pre-human Jesus, just before creating, when he says, let us make. And later Trinitarian readers have taken these plural pronouns to be hints of the Trinity. But you don't agree with either reading. Why? That's correct. I don't. I, I would say if no other divine plurality passages existed in the Hebrew Bible, especially something like Psalm 82, if you wiped those right off the table that they weren't in, your, in the Hebrew Bible, then I would say, well, maybe that works. Maybe one of those two options will work. But because of what we see in divine plurality passages elsewhere, you can't you know, make these assumptions. You know, there's no way exegetically to limit what happens there to two or three entities. And because we have this wider world of divine plurality, it makes a lot more sense to take this as God speaking to the heavenly host, again, undefined numerically, because we don't have any numerical indicators there. And he's announcing his intention to a group. Let us make, you know, humankind in our image. Well, you know, we get these plurals. And then when the creating actually happens, the, the plurals sort of revert back to singulars. You know, then it's God creating humankind in his image. I think the, the most natural reading of that, especially since Genesis 1, and of course Genesis 2 and 3 and on through really Genesis 11, is really tracking on other ancient Near Eastern texts for polemic purposes. And scholars, again, this is not anything new with me, scholars have known this for centuries, that really from Genesis 1 through 11, almost everything in there that is relating especially to the first three chapters, Genesis 6, the flood, and then on into Babel, almost everything in there is taking a swipe, taking a shot at the spiritual worldview of polytheistic cultures of which Israel was familiar and which Israel is rival to, or are rival to you know, the, the Israelite faith, uh, the elevation of, of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And this is a, a classic case because we do have, in other ancient Near Eastern texts, almost word for word in some instances in Genesis 1 and 2, even down to syntactical constructions. This scene here takes a shot at the Babylonian you know, creation story of humanity. And in that case, it's a God speaking again to a, to a group. And there are similarities, and that, that literature is older. So when the, the Hebrew Bible is composed here, this is an intelligent decision to mimic something in some other religion and then give it a poke in the eye by virtue of you know, asserting your own theological position. When this scene is created, there's a reason why, again, there's a familiarity built, and then there's a departure theologically from, again, this ancient Mesopotamia, in this case, uh, creation story. You know, we, we get this announcement to the group, hey, let, let's do this. But when the God of Israel creates and acts, he alone, again, the, 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 the verb forms are all singular, the pronouns become singular. He alone is making the decision to create and is actually the one creating male and female uh, humanity. And he's announcing that, and there's some relationship that that group has to what's happening, but they are not co-creators there. So the singular language, again, you could actually use against, you know, the sort of co-creating language that you would need with a Logos figure. Well, the Logos figure is not even in view here. Again, this is polemic language to distance what's happening from other, again, accounts, other other religions, other beliefs uh, in the ancient Near East that the writer of Genesis, again, has taken a shot at. So it just makes a lot more sense contextually uh, in what we're dealing with, and also not reading the New Testament back into the Old. It makes sense contextually just to sort of read it for what it is. God announces to a group, this is what we're going to do, and then he does it. He acts on his own behalf, his own creative power, and the, and the result is, is humanity. So that also has the benefit of if we look at Genesis 1 this way, and then we encounter these other divine plurality passages, especially where the guys in the other room, the divine characters in the, in, in the room, let's just put it that way, when you get the divine characters in the same room, and some of them turn out to be bad and under judgment, 
and they're going to die like men. Okay, reference back to Psalm 82. Then it's easy to decipher that. If all you were thinking was the Trinity from Genesis 1, then starting to encounter these other passages like Psalm 82, now you're in trouble because now you have the other members of the Trinity as corrupt. Now you have God chastising the Son and the Spirit and saying, hey, you're going to die like men because of what you're, you've done bad here. You're, you're, you're corrupt and evil and wicked. Well, I mean, that, that just creates a conundrum, which is why in a lot of English translations and a lot of, again, early Christian discussion, Psalm 82, the plural Elohim of Psalm 82 are treated as though they're humans because they have to get out of that quandary in some respect. They've, they've been thinking divine plurality means the Trinity all the way along. Then when you encounter a passage like Psalm 82, oh, the gods there aren't really gods, they're humans. Well, how in the world does that happen? Well, it basically happens because we need it to happen because otherwise we're in trouble, you know, theologically, because we haven't been thinking outside the Trinity box. We haven't really been thinking contextually back in Genesis 1. So to the original reader, the sting of it would be that God is doing all the work and the rest of the deities are just kind of on the sideline, apparently watching. He's talking to them, but he's doing it all. Yeah. The verbs of creation, when it comes to humanity, really when it comes to the heavens and the earth and, and human beings are always singular in the Hebrew Bible. And again, that's a very deliberate thing on the part of the writer, again, to make it clear who the creative power is. I don't know how it is in Hebrew, but in an English, this isn't a very strange way of talking. I mean, imagine that you're hanging out with your mom and she says, I know what let's do. Let's make some cookies. Mm -hmm. And then you sit there and hang out with her and she does all the making of the cookies. Right. That's a good illustration. The geek way, the geek talk here would be, this is a plural of exhortation. You know, a singular speaker exhorting, announcing an intention, exhorting people to, hey, you know, let, let's get involved here. We're going to do X, Y, Z. And then, of course, you only have one person doing it. But there's a peripheral benefit, you know, in some context to it.